Hello, my name's Julian Savalescu. I'm the Chen Su Lan Centennial Chair in Medical Ethics at the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. I'm also the Director of the Center for Biomedical Ethics. So one of the questions we, we, for about 30 years, we've been able to reliably test um, embryos and fetuses for um, different genetic conditions. And the question is, you know, should people be uh, free to do this? And uh, different countries have imposed different laws. Um, for example, in the US, there are no restrictions um, on, on genetic testing. Uh, in some countries, um, say particularly Poland, that have a strong Catholic background, no forms of, of genetic testing are permissible. But most other countries have limited the testing. For example, Singapore is one of those, to testing for diseases. Initially, historically, these were life-threatening diseases, and then uh, those uh, constraints were relaxed to include um, severe disorders that are manifested in childhood, and then later, they were relaxed to include dispositions to significant adult onset diseases, such as forms of breast cancer or bowel cancer, or genetic disorders that, such as Huntington's disease that manifest themselves in, around the age of 40 or 50 uh, with progressive dementia and movement disorders. Um, and now we face this question also whether we should further uh, you know, relax testing to include um, more minor uh, uh, dispositions to disease. For example, dispositions to common diseases such as heart disease or diabetes, or even to selecting for advantageous traits like high levels of intelligence or uh, against uh, low normal intelligence. So I mentioned polygenic scores that um, test uh, hundreds of genes at a time can be used to make predictions about the, the IQ range. Now, it's important to remember that, that apart from single gene disorders and chromosomal disorders, um, genetics is often not um, determinative. That is, if one has a risk even of breast cancer, say from having a, a mutation like BRCA1 or 2, it's not certain that an individual will, will get breast cancer. It may be 80% likely, and, and that risk may be uh, able to be addressed with screening. Um, but uh, in, in most uh, genetic conditions outside of single gene disorders, um, the, the, the genetics imp implies a risk or a probability um, of a certain trait. Now, um, one uh, guiding principle in reproductive ethics that has been thought to address uh, uh, these concerns about where to draw the line in terms of uh, our newfound power of genetic selection of embryos or fetuses is the concept of procreative liberty or procreative autonomy or reproductive autonomy. These are, these are all synonyms. And this is the idea that people should be free to choose what kind or in, to, they're ma making decisions about having children, such as when they have children, how many children they have, whether to have children, and indeed what kind of, of children to have. Um, this raises the issue of having uh, designer babies, um, but according to procreative liberty, it should be up to couples or um, single people reproducing to make decisions about what kind of children to have. And, and this is in fact the, the basis of what's sometimes called non-directive counseling in clinical genetics. That information should be provided, but people should be free to make a decision about whether to employ that information and whether to have tests for, say, Down syndrome or cystic fibrosis. But this also implies that if people want to use polygenic scores to select embryos um, that don't have low normal intelligence or, or are predicted to have higher intelligence, then they should be free, excuse me, to do that. So one important concept that mirrors the, um, the, the principle of, of personal autonomy is that of procreative liberty or autonomy. This would of course imply that um, something like sex selection, selecting um, the, the sex of, of an embryo or a fetus should be permissible. There are a number of justifications for procreative liberty or autonomy that reproduction is a private matter. Um, 
families are the ones that have to um, bear the costs and, and each family is different. That, as John Stuart Mill um, argued, we should allow experiments in living and, and in this case allow experiments in reproduction. Um, and the role of a parent is um, to maximise the opportunities of their child. Um, and uh, this doesn't imply that we can't select which child begins uh, to come, come into existence. And it also implies that we should respect the choices of people uh, even to, to, to select in favour of disability or to make no selective decisions at all. Uh, so, you know, what, one of, another way of approaching this is to say, we now have the power to, um, to influence which children are born. Um, who should decide? Um, now, it's important if we decide no one, that is a decision. And, you know, in the case of diseases, that will imply that we're responsible for the the birth of a child with a very serious genetic disorder. So the alternatives to just leaving it to lottery, uh, that we um, leave it to God or nature, the, the survival of the fittest. Um, but it, neither of these seem to be delivering the right answer. For example, nature has no mind to, to happiness or health. Um, it, it simply throws out a variety of different uh, beings that you know will, will happen to survive better or worse in different environmental niches, and and God has given us now the power to make these decisions, uh, and, and surely we should make those decisions on the basis of ethical principles um, that uh, promote good and and right. Uh, so the alternatives are then experts such as philosophers uh, or bioethicists like me. Um, psychologists or scientists, or authorities such as governments or doctors, um, or, or individuals themselves. Um, and, and out of those different groups, it's often thought that because families have the greatest stake, they should make their own decisions um, rather than governments or doctors. And so what, once a government creates a law, they are deciding you know, who will come into existence and who won't. And we'll come to this later uh, in our discussion, but this raises the spectre of eugenics. So eugenics was a movement in the uh, 19th and, uh, and 20th centuries that aimed to produce the fittest offspring. Eugenics literally means well-born. Um, and this was used by governments to sterilise people they judged to be uh, genetically unfit, such as the intellectually disabled, those with psychiatric conditions, criminals, or even the poor. And eugenics was widely practised in, in Western Europe um, and the United States and involved forcible sterilisation of people. Uh, but it reached its peak with, with the Nazi Germans who... Uh, employed it not only to sterilise people, but also to, to kill people in order to bring about a cleaner race. And the reaction to Nazi eugenics was um, this idea that um, individuals should decide, not the government, um, who, what kind of children to have and about their own reproduction, and that we should aim at uh, having uh, using genetics to bring about children who have healthier lives, not to realise some racist social Darwinist state vision of the population. And most importantly, that it should be voluntary, that, as I said, people should make their own decisions. So if you believe that eugenics is wrong, then we should return reproductive decision-making to individuals themselves, and that is procreative liberty or autonomy. Now, of course, as with personal autonomy, we're not free to do just whatever we want. We're restricted by laws around safety um, and around us imposing harms on other people. Um, but importantly in, in genetics, when we're talking about genetic selection, we're talking about which different individual will be brought into existence. So this constraint of, of harming other people doesn't typically apply to the, the child or the offspring itself, unless our actions are such that we make that individual's life go better or worse 
for example, by damaging them during the testing or by selecting an individual that has a life that's so bad that their life is not worth living. But, but those, if the, the testing is safe uh, and we're, we're choosing a condition that's not associated with a life that's not worth living, um, don't place constraints um, on, on selection. So the best interests of the child constraint, which is often grounds laws around genetic selection, really doesn't apply uh, to, to the child themselves when we're talking about selection. There can be distributive justice reasons not to allow certain kinds of selection decisions when, when that child will be expected to uh, require large amounts of, of, of healthcare resources that are seen to be unfairly taken away, taken away from others. But those distributive justices, justice constraints are very controversial. So we seem to be left with this position that in general, um, people should be free to make their own decisions, not just about whether their child suffers from a major genetic disorder, but uh, on other grounds as well, including on the basis of sex. Now this ethically and, and legally flies in the face of many uh, prevailing norms and, and indeed laws of different countries. But, but from the perspective of the value of procreative liberty or autonomy, uh, it seems to imply wide discretion over which choices people can make.